Good morning, everybody. Welcome to AKF. I'm excited to announce a special guest today. Um, I actually have to go back nine years. And nine years ago, I found a Facebook group called New Testament Textual Criticism. And in, in that Facebook group, I learned about James Snap and one of his many books that he has written specifically on the ending of Mark. And so that was the beginning of my relationship with James. And uh, over the years, we've communicated on Facebook, we've communicated via email, we've communicated via Facebook Messenger, and I'm excited to have uh, James finally come out here to visit us and to teach all the way from Indiana. And I'll also mention that he uh, sadly had a stroke uh, just, a, just six months ago, so in March of this year. And so he's still on the path to recovery, but doing a fantastic job. And so with that, I will turn it over to James. Thank you. In this first hour, I'm going to talk about the story of Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery. If you have your Bibles, you'll see that story in the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 7, verse 53. Now, but at this point in the Gospel of John, Jesus and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were already at odds because they didn't like him being the source of authority because they saw themselves as the source of authority, even though they said the law of Moses, but that was their excuse for not accepting Christ. In John 7.53, and so they went each one to his home, or to his house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now at daybreak, he appeared again in the temple, and all the people came to him. Now, a lot of Jesus' ministry was in Galilee. So being in Jerusalem, he's here on the Sadducees' home turf, you could say. This was where they had their headquarters, where the, where the temple was, where they offered the animals, and also where the Romans had the center of power. Jesus sat down and began to teach them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. Making her stand before them all, they told him, Teacher, we found this woman in adultery in the very act. Now in our law, Moses commanded us to stone such a person. What then do you say? They said this to test him in order to have something to accuse him of. However, Jesus bent down and wrote in the ground. But as they continued to ask him, he looked up and said to them, Let the one who is without sin among you throw the first stone at her. Now this is a passage that we're very familiar with. We see it in a lot of movies. Wherever you have Jesus on screen. Um, in the Son of God, the, 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 that wasn't very really accurate. Um, I, wish, I wish they could have me there to advise him. <laughs> so so he's, Jesus stooped down again to write on the ground with his finger. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees might feel like, wait a minute, he's not, he's not falling for our trap. They would be laid. Because if he says, go ahead and stone her, well, they're going to say, where's all this mercy, mercy that you've been talking about? But if he doesn't stone her, they're going to say, oh, Jesus, you're opposing the law of Moses. We have, a, we have law, law, and you don't want us to enforce law. Now, Jesus knew very well that this, neither the scribes nor the, nor the Pharisees had a legal right to enforce the law of Moses. The Romans were in charge. And for the Romans, it was their law that mattered. You couldn't just stone somebody because you didn't like them. You had to go through Roman law. But the scribes and Pharisees brought this case to Jesus. When they heard him say, he who is without sin, throw them a stone. Well, you know very well, all of them had sin. And so did they. So they began to leave one by one, 
So I think the oldest down to the, young, down to the, the youngest. Jesus was left alone with the woman where she was in the middle. Now, they're not alone. I mean, the crowd's still there. But as far as who is now on the scene, it's just Jesus and the woman. All the accusers have dropped the stones and gone away to see what Jesus will do. As for the Son of God, he would have the right to stone her. But he stood up and said, Woman, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, sir, or no one, Lord. Jesus replied, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. So in, in this act of forgiveness, Christ was not accusing the woman. He knew she was guilty, so there's no reason to make more accusations. And she knew she was guilty. But Christ looked into her heart. And Christ said to her, Go and sin no more. He forgave her. Even, even before she, she had expressed with her mouth, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Christ knew her heart. And Christ told her, Go and sin no more. It's a great illustration of the love of God. And how far God is willing to say, I forgive you, even before you say you're sorry. Lots of times we say, I'll forgive this person when he says he's sorry. But Christ shows us his love, even from the cross, when the souls are still in the process of crucifying him, when he's dying on the cross. And he says to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, not only is this passage deeply moving and deeply illustrative of, of God's love, but there's another issue involved. If you look at the bottom of some of the arrivals, I printed out a page here because it didn't have room in the luggage to carry the whole thing. You'll see a footnote. Now, how many people here read the footnotes of your Bibles very much? Okay. You'll know very well. I have a, I'm using the CSB, CSB here, the Christian Standard Bible. And its footnote says, well, first, first before this passage starts, it says, the earliest manuscripts do not include John 7.53 through 8.11. Now, it has it in the text, but it has that note beforehand, the heading. And the footnote says, other manuscripts include all or some of the passage after John in John 7.36, John 7.44, John 7.52, that's what usually found, are... Luke 21, sorry, or John 21, 25, that, that's the end of the book, or, John, or Luke 21, 38. Now, it would be very natural when a person sees this note to say, well, and she and sees the headache that says, the other manuscripts don't include it. It's very natural for a person to say, to say well, James, does this belong there or not? Because a passage can be something very true, very edifying, but still might not be written by John. And what we want is what we've written by the inspired author. We don't want material that's been added in. We want to have God's word. Just like if you have a sword you don't, uh, that's come from the swordsmith in pure form, you don't want somebody to come along and replace the steel with some plastic. How would it feel to go into battle with a plastic sword? We want the true word of God that was initially there, there. But when you see these notes and the footnotes, you would think, well, what should I do with it? Should I keep it? Or, or should I just pretend that it's not there? Well, 
In 85% of the manuscripts of John, the story of the adulteress is there. Also, if you go back in time to the year 383, there were a lot of translations of the Bible in, even back in the Roman times. The Bible was written, well, the New Testament, the Gospel of John, was written in Greek. But most of the people in the West spoke in Latin. And so a whole bunch of people made their own Latin translations. And sometimes you'd be in one church and they'd be having, using one Latin translation, and you'd go to the other church and they'd use a different translation, and sometimes they won't translate it the same way. And so in Rome... Jerome was a scholar who was assigned the task of making one definitive Latin translation. And he said, well, I'm not going to use other people's Latin translations because then people would just say, well, what's yours, boys? Yours better than mine. But Jerome said, I will use the ancient Greek manuscripts. Now, this is not... not now, when you think, see the word ancient today, sometimes we think ancient to us. But to Jerome, he's in, in three, the year 383. These were manuscripts that were already ancient to him. He was born in, 3, in 340. So how many people would say a manuscript is ancient when it's not, no older than you are? Right. So these, these were old manuscripts that Jerome consulted. And in the Latin Vulgate, that he said he'd used ancient Greek manuscripts to make as, as his basis, Jerome included the story of the adulterers. Now, the, these notes are somewhat misleading, and they're not misleading. I don't want to say that they're trying to mislead you, but I would say they're only notes. To really see the de details, you would have to do textual research because holy Eden commentators will say much more than you see in these notes. But um, when it says other manuscripts include the passage after John 7.36, we're talking about a handful of manuscripts, like a dozen. Whereas for the Gospel of John, we have over 1,300 that include the passage. 1,300 is not the same as just 13. It's a difference of a hundred, a hundred, a hundredfold. Also, the footnote says some manuscripts have it after verse 44. But I can tell you, because I've researched it and have seen what, this, what, what we're referring to, not a single Greek manuscript has a passage after John 7:44. The footnote here is talking about the ancient Georgian version copies. Then they say, some have it after John 7 and 52. And th that's where we see it in over 1,385 manuscripts. Uh, Maurice Robinson, uh, can you hold up that Bible? Maurice Robinson has collated every single one. And in that in the Bible that we'll just hold, held up, you'll see that Rob, Dr. Robinson includes John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the story of the, uh, the adulteress in the text without any hesitation. Now, you see also in the footnote, it says some manuscripts have it after Luke 21, 1, 30, 38. And the reason for that is because in the ancient church, they have, would have what we called lectionaries. Has anybody ever seen a lectionary? Okay. Well, a lectionary was an ancient book that was designed so that when you read the Gospels, you wouldn't have to cross-reference this passage to that passage to that passage to see everything that was going on when parallel passages. You had passages assigned to be read each day of when the church gathered. So, say, instead of having the Bible in, in continu continuous script, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you would have this piece is to be read, this piece of Matthew is to be read on this Sunday, 
and then maybe after you get through Matthew, then you go on to Mark, but you have it divided into pieces for each, each day. So on Pentecost Sunday, they would read John 7, 36, 37, and then stop at John 7, 32, and then skip to verse 12 of chapter 8. Because about when you think about Pentecost, you think about the coming, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The incident with the adulteress is not, not the same theme. And so they would jump from 752 and read from there, verse 12, skipping those 12 verses. Now, somewhere along the way, somebody had a copy that was marked. And we still have several copies, well, actually, actually more than just a shovel, that have dots beside 753 through 811. But those dots aren't just to say, now, now some people try to say, these dots mean the scribes weren't sure whether, whether they're included or not. But they, that's because they never understood themselves what, the scribes, what, those, dots, what, what those symbols mean. The symbols mean... Skip over this passage when you're reading it for Pentecost. It doesn't mean erase it. It means skip over it for Pentecost. If you have, if you know what this lecture was supposed to do, the lecture is supposed to do the reading, because in those days, it wasn't everybody reading the Bible to church. Bibles were too expensive to make. How many people here have, have a Bible made of calcite? You might have a cover made of cow, but in those days, to get, even get a Bible, you have, you have to go kill a cow, go kill that cow, go kill the next cow, and make, make the parchment, and then, then have somebody who knows how to write, write it. So it all had to be done by hand, both the producing of the page and the writing, writing of the manuscript. The printing press didn't come along until 1450. So in the Roman Empire, the church would have the Bible. And you might even have... Say, say a copy of the Gospel of Mark, or a copy of the Gospels together. But most people did not have the entire Bible that you could have your own copy to carry, carry around. So imagine what it would be like if you were a, a scribe and you sat down to write, to write your own copy, and in the copy that you were copying from, you saw these marks. This copy came from some other church. You were, you were making your own church copy, and you see the, these dots, and you think, what are these dots here for? And a scribe somewhere along the line thought the same thing that we just described earlier. Maybe this scribe means it doesn't belong there. And so, guess what he did? He skipped, just like they did in, in the, 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 the lectionary, from verse 52 down to 812. And thus the whole passage disappeared in the copy he was making. And that happened to influence a, a, a transmission stream that, that, that influenced a transmission stream or a line, line of copies in, in Egypt very much. And so in the copy in, in Egypt, but that mistake had been made, their copies did not have Mark, Mark, Mark sorry, I get ahead of myself. Like the, the, their copies did not have John 753 through 812. I'm sorry, through 811. But everywhere else, you can look and see that in the writings of many, many of the church fathers or the writers, people who led the church, many of them, like Ambrose and Augustine, Many of them, and I, I could give you a, a long list. Many of them refer to this passage, and their references go back to into the, the three hundreds, even into the two hundreds. Also, we have the old Latin manuscripts in their summaries of the gospel, because even though we sometimes think that our, our notes, our, our our Bibles have these new things like footnotes. Bibles back then did do, and Bibles had, had a chapter summaries of Will's holding on right there. Now, this isn't is that old, 
It's only about 450 years old. This is a copy of the, the, the Geneva Bible that came from in the 1500s. This is a page from Genesis that he's holding up. And uh, we'll, we'll get back to that later on. But in the vast number of manuscripts, the passage in here about, about the adulteress is included. And so it would be very, I think, hasty of somebody to say, well, it's not in some manuscripts because you can see why it's not in there. Because they were using the lectionary and didn't understand what the symbols were there for. Anybody who does understand what those are there for, there's no problem. Because all you do is once, once a year, when Pentecost comes, you skip over that passage. But when, when October the 8th comes, which was in the old days called St. Pelagius Day, on those days, the passage, the passage would, would be read. And so it was never, never missing because it was simply a matter of what day it was assigned to, to read it. And that's why this passage should be fully accepted as part of the Word of God.